Now, we're finishing this series uh, talking about this subject from Exodus chapter 4, they'll believe. Just look at your neighbor and say, they'll believe. They'll believe. Yeah. Now, look at your other favorite neighbor, your least favorite neighbor, and say, they'll believe. You looked at the first one first. Don't blame me. If you're sitting by somebody you should have looked at first, it ain't my fault. <laughs> Got him. Now, uh, I'm going to read the verses from Exodus in the sermon. You would think that after the revelations and promises that God gave Moses in chapter 3, uh, that he would stop resisting his divine destiny. You would think that. These promises would have been enough to send him enthusiastically on his way. After all, God did say, listen, I'm going to send you, but I'll be with you. And then they said, he said, well, they don't know who you are. What's your name? He said, I am that I am. He said, well, what about Pharaoh? He said, I'm going to strike Pharaoh at his heart where it hurts. Don't worry about Pharaoh. And when you leave, you won't leave empty handed. I'll make sure your pockets are full and running over. You would have thought that would be enough. But it didn't send Moses enthusiastically on his way. Even as he's standing barefoot in front of a burning bush, listening to the voice of God speak to him personally and directly, that wasn't enough. Even after he, 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 he got a chance that the, the promise of God, the, the presence of God would always be with him, even after the revelation of the impact of just his name, Moses still had doubts. And I began to wonder what makes us doubt ourselves. <clears throat> when we were flying to Africa a couple of weeks ago, uh, I don't know which hour it was, but it was one of the, the hour and a half in our 969 hour flight to Africa <laughs> that I was watching Thor, Thor Ragnarok, I think that's how you say it. And Thor Y'all know Thor. Everybody knows who Thor is. He looks kind of like me, except he's white with long hair. Thor <coughs> has this hammer <laughs> that, that we thought gave him his strength. Uh, but in this movie, his hammer is destroyed. But he still has enough strength because Thor discovers that the strength was not in his hammer. The strength was inside of him all along. The hammer is what focused his strength and when he was able to focus hear me what was on the inside of him he could access the power of God thunder and lightning because he realized what was on the inside of him he could access the power that God gave him because he I'm gonna say it till you get it because he realized what was on the inside y'all making this harder than I wanted to be look at your neighbor and say it was an inside job Why is it that so many of us continue to fall into what I call the Moses mold? Why is it that when we look at our assignment, then we look at ourselves in the mirror, we're tempted to think God made a mistake? Why is it? that we project our fears about ourselves into how people feel about us. We'll start to say, well, I'm not what they think I am, so they shouldn't think I am what I am. After all, how many times has God had to tell you you're the head, but you act like the tail? How many times does God have to remind you you're above, so stop living beneath? How many times does he have to give us economic advice by saying you should be the lender, not the borrower? How many times does he have to remind you, I don't care what the scoreboard says, you are more than a conqueror. Yet we live like we've been conquered and captured. How do we keep falling into the Moses mode? Well, I want to talk to you today because God has a call. He has an assignment even for you. Well, I'm too young. God knows no respect of age well I'm too old Eight, Moses was 80 so he can use anybody if he can call Moses for the first time at 80 what's your excuse but when God causes you when God puts you in a position where he informs you of what he'd like for you to do and it causes you to go 
into a Moses mode and you begin to speculate. I wonder how they'll feel about me. I wonder if they'll receive me. I wonder if they'll accept me. I wonder if they'll acknowledge me. I want you to know they will believe. Just hunt somebody and say they will believe. Maybe they won't listen to me, but they'll hear you. They will believe. Well, when will they believe? Let's get into this, this text. Exodus chapter 4, verse 1. After God promises Moses, I'll be there with you. My presence will be there. I'm going to take care of Pharaoh. You go leave ball in after he promises him all of that. Moses answered, verse 1, but behold, they will not believe me or listen to my voice, for they will say the Lord did not appear to you. The Lord said to him, what's in your hand? He said, a staff. Number one, they'll believe you when you recognize what's in your hand. They'll believe you when you recognize what's in your hand. Moses is thinking, hold up, hold on, God. So you want me to go back to Egypt. That's bad enough. But then you want me to go to Pharaoh. See, Lord, what had happened was when I was there before trying to be a deliverer because God is saying, I'm sending you back as a deliverer. But Moses is probably saying, I tried that before and it didn't work out too good for me because I ended up on the run. Remember I told you last week, it wasn't Jay-Z and Beyonce. They came up with the on the run tour. It was Moses. He started a long time ago. He said, I'm on the run for murder. You want to send me back? God, you know, they locking up brothers and throwing away the keys. I'm not the one you want to send back. I don't have the credibility. I don't have the voice. I don't have the authority. I don't have the power. Let me say something to you, Moses and Mosella. Mosina? Moesha, M to the... Let me say something to you. God is getting ready to send you places you don't feel qualified to go. God is getting ready to put you in places you're not qualified to be in. He's getting ready to open doors that other people have tried to slam in your face. And when you get there, make sure you tell the story right. Don't you dare say I worked hard to get here. Don't you dare say I went to school a long time. Don't you say I put in my blood, sweat, and tears. Here's your response if it had not been for the Lord on my side. But these people ain't going to listen to me. Go. What if they say you ain't talk to God? Go. What if they don't want to do it? Go, Moses. You're worrying about the wrong thing. Obedience is your responsibility. The outcome is my responsibility. If God tells you to go, he has a reason for you to go. And even if what you consider to be success is not on the agenda, what he considers to be success is success. And you can't understand how God thinks because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so we don't interpret things the same way. Who would have thought you can gain a victory by dying? Who would have thought that the way to be exalted is to be knocked down? Who would have thought the way to get more is to give? God's numbers don't add up the same way we do. Sending you back to be a deliverer, yes, is going to be hard, but I'll be with you. And do you know who I am? I am that I am. Moses, I'm, I'm sick of having this conversation. Dude, what's in your hand? It's a stick. Listen, God asked the question not because he needed an answer, but because he needed to divert Moses' attention. He said, listen, you, you, you're thinking about the wrong thing. You're worried about the wrong thing. You need to understand what's in your hand. What's in your hand? It's an idiom. What, what do you have access to? What's in your possession? What's in your wheelhouse? What is in your hand? Everybody has something in their hand. And while you're looking at your hand, you can't be worried about what's in somebody else's hand. You don't have to be jealous. You don't have to be envious of what's in somebody else's hand because God didn't give anybody everything, but he gave everybody something. What's in your hand? What do you have access to? What, what, what do you need? Don't worry about what you don't have because God is already what you don't even know you need yet. 
I'm going to say it so you can catch it. God is already what you don't even know you need yet. You don't believe me? Let me give you Bible to back it up. You remember that man laying by the pool? He had been there for 38 years. How long had he been sick? I don't know, but I know he had been at this pool sick for 38 years. Jesus walks up and says, sir, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be made well? He answered, you know what? If you want to burn me up, answer a question I didn't ask you. Am I the only one that that's a pet peeve when people answer questions you didn't ask? He said, do you want to be made well? The man said, I don't have nobody talking to the right somebody. But you know why people miss the right people? Because they too caught up on the wrong people. I told y'all the quieter you are, the longer I preach. I hadn't planned on saying this, but y'all being quiet gave me time to be petty. I wonder how many people are suffering in a relationship, praying for the right one, but still playing with the wrong one. Y'all decided to be quiet. Here I come. Oh, here we go. What, what's in your hand? What do you have? I'm already what you don't know you need. Jesus, here in church, the men's ministry is 5,000 deep, not including the women and the children. The disciples say, Jesus, let these people go. They've been in church a long time, and they're hungry, and we don't have enough to feed them. Jesus said, you're focusing on the wrong thing. You're focusing on what you don't have. What do you have? All we have is a lunch. It looks like a lunch in your hand. It's a lavish buffet in my hands because God is already what you don't even know you need yet. They didn't know they needed a multiplier, but he's a multiplier. They didn't know they needed the God of the leftover, but he can leave some leftovers. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Come here, David. Tell him about your experience with Goliath. David told me to tell you because he don't want to talk to you. He don't know you like that. David said, listen, his daddy told him to take some cheeses to his brothers. They were on the front line in the war zone. And when David arrived, he, uh, he, 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 didn't, he didn't understand what was going on. There's a big giant out there cussing and swearing, defaming God's army and God of heaven. And he said, what's, a, who, who, what's the reward for the person that cuts down this big dude with the big mouth? And uh, they said, listen, the king got a lot of rewards for him. He said, well, take me to the king. And the king heard there was somebody willing to face the giant. But when he saw David, he said, hold on. <laughs> listen, man, you little bitty dude, you like a twig to him. He been killing people since he was a little boy. And you know about a little boy? David said, hold on, you don't know me like that. You don't know what I had to deal with out there trying to protect these sheep from the lions, tigers, and bears. You don't know what I had to go through. Saul said, since you go fight, take my armor. Take my shield and take my sword. David said, hold on, you've been taking L's with your own stuff. Don't try to make me take an L with it too. If your armor, if what you got in your hand ain't working for you, let me use what God put in my hand. All I need is a rag and five rocks. Really, all he needed for Goliath was one rock. The other four was for any of Goliath's kinfolks that wanted to step up. Because God always leaves some leftovers. Tell your neighbor he always leaves some leftovers. God promised to provide everything we need. Everything you need is in your reach. And if God promised to supply all our needs and you're looking for something you don't have, it's because you didn't need it to get where you're going. How do I recognize what's in my hand? Well, let's look at what's in Moses' hand. How do I recognize it? What, what, what does Moses' staff represent? Number one, it represents his identity. Somebody shout identity. How did that represent his identity? Because Moses was a shepherd. And every shepherd had a staff. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy... Every shepherd had a staff. When he called Peter, Peter was a fisherman. He called Moses. Moses was a shepherd. God didn't change their occupation. He changed its application. He said, look, Moses, you've been shepherding your father-in-law's sheep. I need you to come shepherd my sheep. You've been leading his flocks. I need you to come lead my flock. And God will take what you have and make it something that everybody needs. What's in your hand? What, what do you have that God has given you so he can use it to work through you 
for his glory. It, was, it, it represented his identity. Secondly, this staff represented his income. Somebody say income. He was a vocational shepherd. He wasn't a shepherd for play. He was a shepherd because he needed to eat. It was his vocation. It, was, it, it, it represented his business. God was going to use his business for his business. You didn't get the word play. That was Lil Wayne-ish. He's going to use his business for his business. Which means God wants to use where you work to work for him. We want to keep Jesus in the sanctuary, but he works the same in the marketplace. And I know what y'all saying. I can't be in there preaching and talking about Jesus. You don't have to even mention God. All you have to do is love like the Lord told you to love. All you have to do is live like the Lord told you to live. All you have to do is smile sometimes. Quit looking so mean all the time. Learn how to say good morning. Learn how to say excuse me. Learn how to say thank you. Learn how to open the door for people. Learn how to say have a nice day. All you got to do is act God-ish and he'll take care of the rest. You ain't got to be up in there slanging oil all over the place and laying out praying and ashata hashataying. He didn't say people will know you belong to me by how you pray. He said by how you love one another. But you don't understand these people are my enemies. Love your enemies and pray for those because that's how God works. It represented his identity. It represented his income. Then lastly, it represented his influence because with his staff, he would guide the sheep. With his staff, he would correct the sheep. With his staff, he would rescue the sheep. He would protect them from enemies and without, from without, and he would protect them from the enemy, enemy. Because some of us realize that our worst enemy is the one we look at in the mirror and admire every morning. But God will send somebody with a staff to rescue you, correct you, and guide you. The problem is re we resist those who God allows to remain. We don't like being protected from ourselves. We don't like people correcting us. We don't mind people correcting other people. But don't correct me with what's wrong with me. That's why it's hard. That's why I, 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 it's hard for me to do counseling. It's hard for me to do relationship counseling because usually in a relationship counseling session, everybody wants you to shine the light on the other person. And you know, this generation, I, you know, my generation and down, oh my God. <laughs> we should have got more whoopings, but we were coddled, we were spoiled. We was made to believe that everything was somebody else's fault, you know. If, you know, when, when I was growing up, if a teacher called you to the school, it was going to be the parent and the teacher against the student. Now, if a parent is called to school, it's the parent and the student against the teacher. Oh, uh, none! Of, ain't no educators in here. Y'all can say it. Y'all say it. I said it. Now, I ain't going to get mad at you. They get mad at me. We don't like being told when we're wrong. We don't like, we, we've mastered the art of starting fires and playing the burn victim every day. And people who talk sense, they don't want to talk to. If you're talking noise, if you believe in them, you're getting in it with them. If you're wallowing with them, they're your friend. But the moment you tell them something real they need to hear, they don't want to talk to you because when you're petty like that, solutions make you sick to your stomach. If you have a solution, you don't get the attention from being a victim. If you have a solution, you don't get the attention from being done wrong. It was your decision. You did yourself wrong. Who chose him or her? You. Who made the decision to go? You. Who responded to the text? You. Who answered the call? Don't blame Siri. She ain't answered your call for you. It might be Siri saying your bae is calling, but you programmed the name. So, 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 they'll believe when you, when you realize what's in your hand. Let's read verse number three. So listen, to, let, me, let me give you, remember, God said, Moses, what's in your hand? He said, a staff. And he, meaning God, said, throw it on the ground. So he, meaning Moses, threw it on the ground, and it became a serpent, it being the stick. And Moses ran from it, it being the stick that's no longer a stick, is now a snake. He threw it on the ground. Moses ran. Smart Moses. I would have done the same thing. 
I love animals. Love them to death. However, if anything I'm holding in my hand turns into something that slithers or flies, I'm going to run and you can inform me about what happened next. If Listen, I ain't scared of butterfly, but if this mic turned into a butterfly, I'm out. Y'all can follow me or stay here and see what happens next. I'm running. I'm not asking no questions. Hey, you ain't need to be scared of no snake. I'm not afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of sticks that become snakes. That quick, I'm telling you. If he say throw it down, it becomes a snake. When you see me, all you're going to see is the color of my clothes because I'm running out of them like Wile E. Coyote. That ain't me. That's, how Steve, that's why Steve Irwin's not here right now. He couldn't make it. You know what he'd have did? He'd have ran up, oh my gosh, look at the size of that monster. <laughs> not me. I'm running. How many of you would run too? Tell the truth. Let me see. All right. So Moses ran. He, he released it. Moses ran from it like he always did. What do you mean like he always did? I'm going to show you in just a second. He did the same thing he did 40 years ago. He ran from the serpent. I'm going to show it to you in just a second. But let's get to this. So you got to release what's in your hand. They'll believe you when you release what's in your hand. Somebody say release it. Release. Now understand this, class. Listen, when God asks you for something, it's not for his benefit. It's for your benefit. When, when God says, give me what you have, it's usually so he can give it back to you better. When God says, give me what you have. Listen, Moses, if I'm going to work through you, I need you to let go of that staff so I can show you what the same staff can do if you put it in my hand. Moses, if you're going to see a miracle, I need your staff. And if you're listening today and you've been praying for God to be a deliverer, you've been praying for God to come through, you've been praying for a miracle, if you want to see God's power work through who you are, you've got to be willing to release what, he, what you have in your hand. When you release it, he gives it back to you. Somebody in here knows the more time I give God, the more he gives me back. The more my influence I let God have, the more he gives me back. The more I open doors for people, the more doors he opens for me. The more I give, the more he gives to me. If you want more of it, you've got to give it away. If the more you praise God, the more reasons he gives you to praise. The more you worship God, the more of him he reveals so you'll know who he is. Whatever you give to God, he gives it back. Listen, we did good as a church. Here at Bayview, in over 30 years, out of our own pocket, we, gave a, we have given away $1.5 million in scholarships to our own students. We were generous. We put it, money away every week. We do it every year. Some people have private scholarships. We have one. Other people have them. $1.5 million in 30 years. God kept his promise because here's his promise. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking together, and running over shall other men give to you. We gave away 1.5 in 30 years. They gave away 4.5 in eight hours because when you give, he always gives you more in return. And it wasn't just our students that got blessed. People that never been to Bayview, people who may never come back to Bayview, don't even know our name, but they always say, because of that church on the hill, my baby's going to college. Because of that church on the hill, we don't have to pay for anything. Because of that church on the hill, his life is different. Her life is different. It will never be the same because when you give it away, God gives you more. Know that whatever God has given you is for this moment, this moment in your life right now. Whatever he's given to you is for what he's calling you to do. But you can't be stingy and expect God to show up. You can't be stingy and expect God to show out. You can't be stingy and expect God to allow you to see his power. I wonder how many people in here are living unfulfilled lives because you're trying to hold on to full hands. Here's a question for those who don't want to release what you have. If what you're holding on to it's not giving you what you need. Why hold on to it? 
if what you're holding on to is not taking you where you want to go while you're holding on to it, let it go and let God lead you. Let me move on because I said we're going to be done by 1230. Exodus chapter 4, verse 4. But the Lord said to Moses, put your hand out and catch it by the tail. Uh -uh. So he put out his hand and he caught it and it became a staff in his hand that they may believe they will believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. So the third thing you got to do, they'll believe when you recognize what you have, when you release what you have thirdly, when you learn to rely on what's in your hand. You got to rely on what's in your hand. God said, Moses, what's in your hand, dude? He said, a stick. Ain't nothing special. We live in Southern California. You've seen a stick before. You seen the how many of you have seen a dried up stick or a branch somewhere? You seen it? It's a stick. There's nothing special about a stick. You don't feel, you don't put it on Facebook when you find a stick. You on Instagram, look at this stick I found. Nobody cares. There's sticks everywhere. It's a stick. It's a stick in Moses' hand. But when God sees you release it to him, he gives it back to you with a little more than he left you with. With the same stick, Moses performed miracles. With the same stick, he called down plagues on the, on the land of Egypt. With the same stick, he parted the Red Sea. With the same stick, he brought water from a rock. With the same stick, he won victory over Amalek's armies. Because what's in your hand, the appraisal, the value is different in your hands and God's hands. I can make some shoes and put my name on it. And Mike can sell them for $50. Michael Jordan makes some shoes and put his name on it. He can sell them for $300. Because when his name is on it, it means more. And when God's name is on what you have, it's, it's worth just a little bit more. Thank God for Moses. Couldn't have been me. The story would have ended. And he threw it on the ground, it turned into a snake, and Terry ran, the end. That was the only thing that would have been left. He left his sandals, he left his stick, he left everything. <laughs> God, why are you trying to work through this ordinary stick? Because I'm trying to show you that I have a habit of using underrated things to do unheard of things. Throw the stick down. It becomes a snake. Now pick it up by the tail. Hold up. I'm not a zoologist. I'm not a veterinarian. But I do know this. If you're going to pick up a snake, especially in the reason, region where Moses is tasked to pick up a snake, there's a 99.8% chance that, that this was a venomous snake. snake. Wasn't a boa constrictor, wasn't an anaconda. They didn't live there. So it was a venomous snake that he told to pick up by the tail. So first of all, you don't ever pick up a snake by the tail because it makes snakes mad, number one. Number two, Snakes don't have a spine like you and I. They can coil in any direction, and a mad, venomous snake ain't what you want to be holding by the tail. That's not the dangerous end. If you want to pick a snake up, you pick him up behind his head, especially a venomous snake. You want to put your palm on his head, slip your hand under, I guess that would be his neck, it's all the same, under his neck, and you pick him up, but you keep your thumb on the back of his head, or two thumbs, depending on the size of the snake, so he cannot bite you. Now, his body might coil around you, but because he's not a constrictor, he can't keep you confined. If a venomous snake coils up, you can uncoil him. Now, if it's a constrictor, an anaconda, or something like that, game over. If he wrap up around your waist, I hope you got your affairs in order, because it's a done deal. But this wasn't that. Pick him up by the tail. God, what are you trying to prove? You want me to say I'm scared? Fine, I'm scared. Is that what you wanted to hear? 
You he, he was trying to show him something. Now, what's the significance? I told you, 40 years earlier, Moses ran from the serpent. I didn't read that. Well, you read it, but let me interpret it for you. Remember when he ran from Pharaoh? The symbol for Egypt and Pharaoh was a poisonous snake. Okay, three people got it. He ran from a poisonous snake earlier. God says, I want to send you back, but I need to make sure you ain't as scared as you were back then. To show you that I'm going to give you authority over your adversaries, let me show you how you can handle him. Pick him up by the tail. Do something out of the ordinary. Do something unheard of. And I'm going to show you that I can do unheard of things with underrated people. I don't know who I'm talking to, but here's your message from God right now. You've run long enough. You've run from your past long enough. You've run from your mistakes long enough. You've run from indecision long enough. You've run from depression long enough. You've run from your bad decisions, your mistakes, your choices long enough. Running time is over. Look at your neighbor and tell them running time is over. So pick him up by the tail. I'll show you how much authority I'm going to give you over your enemies. I can imagine right now God is probably getting frustrated because every time he asks for a sign, God gives him one, but he keeps ignoring them. Let me tell you something. Don't ignore signs you ask God to show you. Y'all was kind of quiet on that one. Don't ignore. Some of y'all don't want to look at me, but that's all right. You ignoring the signs. Lord, show me. I, I need you to send me the right man. Well, you got Mr. Wrong. I need you to show me the right woman, but you're hanging on to that woman. I'll talk to you. Yeah, I see some of y'all Facebook statuses too. You were single Monday in a relationship Wednesday. It was complicated Friday, and you crying on Sunday. I told you, you can't be praying for the right one while you're waiting on your ex to get it together. Every time y'all get quiet, I get petty. I'm sorry. God ain't through with me yet. Moses, pick it up by the tail so I can show you protected. Don't y'all know Moses' whole walk changed? Y'all know that, right? Can you imagine Moses walking with that stick in the desert? He all tired. But soon as he figured he could throw the stick down and it'll become a snake, and he can pick it back up. You know Moses came walking different with they, <laughs> with the stick under his arm. <laughs> Pharaoh, let me holler at you for a minute. Can you imagine how much confidence he must have? God is trying to allow you to do something that nobody should be able to do so he can let you know I've given you power that nobody else has had before. Why does he need Moses to have confidence and self-esteem? Because he's going back to a hostile place. Pharaoh ain't going to be happy to see him. That's why he's trying to build your confidence. That's why God is giving you small wins. That's why he keeps trying to show you these signs that you keep ignoring. You've got to understand, he's trying to build your confidence for the crisis he's sending you back to. Somebody in here right now, you need that self-confidence. Let me explain to you what confidence is. Confidence is not that they, everybody's going to like me. Confidence is I'll be fine if you don't like me. That's what confidence is. Confidence is it's not I hope everybody like me. Confidence is, listen, you don't have to like me. I like me and God loves me. You don't like me because of what you think. God knows everything about me and loves me. So you don't have to like me. I'm cool with me. jump back want to kiss myself hey, hey I was I got caught up I'm sorry say it loud huh I'm gonna get it but listen I'm done running time is over realize what's in your hand release what's in your hand 
then rely on what's in your hand. What he's put in your hand helps you to focus your power. Just be who you are. You know why you have to be who you are? Because he wants to use who you are, not who you pretend to be.